and welcome to our MUSAR study group. I invite you. Straightforward MUSAR, but MUSAR is woven all throughout both of these books. The first one we're doing is Life in the Balance written by a rabbi and a psychologist, a father and a son. So one of them talks a little bit more about the uh, Torah side of things and the other one a little bit more about uh, the psychology of some of these character traits. The other book that we'll be studying a little bit later in the class is Windows to the Soul and Leah Rebold will be covering that part of our class. Now, last week we talked about the character trait of happiness and how it's so important uh, in so many ways and gave us some tips on how to get to happy. Um, tonight we're covering chesed uh, or kindness. So I, I'm drinking out of my, I don't know if you can see it, my be kind cup. <laughs> so just to remind us that chesed is uh, kindness. And really chesed uh, is central to our lives in Judaism. Uh, in fact, it says that um, God began the Torah with kindness and ended the Torah with kindness. He began the Torah with clothing man and ended the Torah with burying Moshe. Uh, in fact, Rabbi Simla expounds on this. It says its beginning is the performance of kindness and its end is the performance of kindness. Its beginning is the performance of kindness as it is written and Hashem made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and he clothed them. And its end is the performance of kindness. As it is written, he buried him in the depression. So right from the very beginning of the Torah, we are seeing the importance of chesed and Hashem being the model for that. Rabbi Rabbeinu Bakia says everything needs kindness and kindness has no boundaries or end it has no limits um in fact in our morning prayers there one of the morning prayers is that this is uh uh the precept that has no prescribed one of the precepts that has no prescribed limits or prescribed measures so it's limitless King David often praised the many chesed acts or kind acts of Hashem in his Psalms. Uh, in fact, Psalm 89.3, when he created the world, um, oh no, the world is built on chesed, on kindness. When he created the world, Hashem permeated the world with the attribute of chesed. Even in the Mishkan, uh, chesed is built in. It says that the Mishkan is uh, modeled after the three pillars of the Jewish life, Torah, Avodah, which is prayer, and Chassid, uh, which is acts of kindness. Now we can uh, see where the symbolism of Torah comes in. That would be in the Ark in the Holy of Holies. Um, just, the, uh, we need uh, someone to mute. And of course, the prayers is uh, obvious when we, you know, the whole service in the Mishkan uh, represented there. But where is Hesed represented in the Mishkan? And we might have to look, look a little deeper to see where this is really represented. It says, uh, in the Briach Hatichon, the middle bar, you know, there were vertical bars around holding the Mishkan up. And then there was a vertical bar that kind of provided stability for the vertical bars. And that is the representation of Chesed. It says that it provides the necessary stability um, to secure the Mishkan uh, into a stable structure. And the Briach Hatichon, this middle bar, was made from the Eshel of Avraham, and the tree that was symbolic of his Eshel. And Eshel is an acronym for food, drink, and lodging. And we know that Avraham was full of chesed, full of kindness, opened his tents to strangers uh, coming in on all sides. 
And it says that the tree that was planted in Beersheba represented the Eshel of Avraham, or the, the, the food, lodging, and drink that he provided to strangers uh, on a regular basis. Now, this Briach HaTechon, or this middle bar that represents Hasid, had two opposing characteristics. One was that it was rigid enough to provide stability, but flexible enough to wrap around the sides of the Mishkan. So the same way with our Hasid. Um, it, you know, it plays such a pivotal role in our daily life the stable presence of chesed. It's a foundation of our life, provides stability. On the other hand, uh, there needs to be flexibility, uh, interacting with others in a manner that shows empathy, empathy to their situation, to their pain, to their needs, uh, to make them feel cared for and understood. And this comes from the flexibility side of chesed. So how do we develop chesed as a strong characteristic in our life, a strong midot? Well, the first thing we have to do is overcome self. Uh, man is kind of created to look at himself first and his needs. So to fully develop chesed, it is necessary that we be proactive because it's not going to be just coming to us really naturally. In a well-known passage in Micah, it says, what does Hashem require of you? To be doers of justice and lovers of kindness. Now, why does it say doers of justice and lovers of kindness? It says that, because uh, when it comes to kindness, our obligation should be kind of like a person in love. And if you remember those days or you've seen it in a movie, the person in love his object of his desire. He's going after it. He, we need to be with Hesed. We need to be rather than just waiting. to show up. We are living in a, um, in a world in where we are interconnected to each other and we have an obligation to one another. It, it compares it to uh, that we need to see that we, basically we are not the center of the universe. Uh, just like the earth revolves around the sun and other um, planets uh, revolve around the sun, all in this kind of interconnected universe. So that's how we live. The Shem is the center and then uh, we are all different universes surrounding him. And we really need that idea that we are connected to something bigger than ourselves. If how sad we would be if we were the center of our universe. Um, it says that um, Torah recognizes two characteristics of every human being. We have a natural instinct for self-interest. Um, we, we talk sometimes about if, if, if Shemaim is so wonderful, you know, why are we so... Uh, committed to staying here. We will do anything. We'll take any pill, take any treatment to stay here. I think that's instinct because otherwise we just float off the planet. But the other one is that a person <clears throat> uh, needs to be uh, uh, mindful of others. It says a person is considered related to himself, but he also has a moral imperative to help others. So we have to overcome, first of all, this natural tendency to just focus on our needs. And if we want to pursue chesed, this is what we have to do. So first of all, we have to uh, fight that natural inclination to take care of me first. 
And they tell a great story about Rabbi Yehuda, son of Rabbi Eli. Uh, and at that time, poverty was very great. So six of his students had to cover themselves with one blanket. And yet it said they labored in the study of Torah. Uh, the author of Ham explained that normally when a person, and you who are married can probably uh, experience this, um, you know, you're each pulling for the covers, you know, uh, you, you all of a sudden you're uncovered and you grab the blanket and you pull the cover, and then the other person pulls it back and it's a constant tug of war. Um, so, but what we have to do is suppress the natural tendency to pull that blanket, but rather to uh, not pull on the blanket so that all six of those people that are under that blanket have some of the blanket. And it says, if one suppresses his own needs and is inspired by a true sense of sharing, he will discipline himself never to pull the blanket towards himself, even while he's asleep. So chesed, even while you're sleeping. Uh, it is such an environment of selflessness that the Torah, that the Talmud tells us the Torah can truly be learned then at the highest levels. So even if you're sleeping, if you're not pulling the blanket towards you, you're still involved in Torah. Isn't that wonderful? So let's talk about empathy a little bit. Um, sharing the burden of each other. Empathetic feelings are known to be important building blocks that facilitate the process of helping others. If you don't have any empathy for someone, it's a whole lot harder to force yourself to, to think chesed and to help one another. Um, the ability to put oneself in the shoes of someone else. This is where empathy kind of starts, to be able to kind of put yourself in their position, feel their pain, feel their struggle, um, identify with what they're going through. It also says that empathy is a great tool for good parenting um, and also a very necessary skill for interpersonal communication and interaction. So empathy is good for lots of things, but especially for Hudson. In Pirkei Avot, which many people are studying right now, uh, it says that of the 48 characteristics required to really master Torah, one of them is chesed, um, is to bear one another's burdens. Um, and the Tifer Israel interprets this to mean that empathy is not solely a matter of the heart. So empathy is not just an emotion, but it's to feel the suffering of one's friend and then do something to offer him financial support, emotional support, to take an active, not just call him up and wish them well. Uh, I think there's a scripture in the Brit Hadashah that says, uh, you know, you, you, your friend says he's cold and you say, well, good, have a good night, a warm night and go on in your way, but you don't offer him a blanket or food to eat. So it also requires actually doing something. It says, even to the extent of extending oneself and efforts more perhaps than the recipient. So, you know, you don't mind helping a friend move as long as they're carrying as many boxes as you are. But when they're sitting down having coffee and you're carrying all the boxes, it's a little bit harder to be empathetic. Um, then it talks about a famous story. We've talked about this in the youth many times, is the donkey of your enemy. It, Torah says, if you see the donkey of your enemy uh, crouching under its burden, you must uh, not leave him there. You shall help him repeatedly get that donkey back up. In fact, it even goes so, the, the expansion of that story lesson is that if you have a friend whose donkey is struggling and you have an enemy whose donkey is struggling, you help the enemy first and then help your friend. So how far do we have to go? How far do we have to go in showing this person chesed? Sages say that the person being helped cannot abdicate his responsibility. So the person you're helping to move cannot just sit over there and have coffee. They've actually got to pitch in and help as they can. Um, it's a cooperative act when the person in need is shouldering the burden together with the one offering assistance. 
Uh, it's an obligation to share the burden, not necessarily carry the burden. Um, but Hesed is a very broad concept. Um, and it's not, like I said, it's not just enough to call up someone and say, I'm wishing you well. It's not enough just to put a check in the mail, but it actually requires physical involvement. Uh, <clears throat> if, if they need something, then you're physically there to help them do that. So uh, the next section talks about the cost of something it calls affluenza, not, not the flu, this is affluenza. And in, if you remember a few years ago, there was a teen who got into some trouble. He uh, drunk driving, injured or killed some people. And he tried, his lawyers tried as a defense, the affluenza defense it's called. He was affluent. He had everything he needed. He went to the best schools and the best vacations. And therefore, this was just a part of his affluent lifestyle. And so what is the cost of affluenza? Uh, it says that when money becomes the central thing to your self-worth or your ego, uh, your self-esteem, that this is when trouble comes in. It will cause overall lower satisfaction with your life. You will have low energy levels, difficulty with sharing what you do have, just general dissatisfaction with your job or your career, and just generally poor psychological adjustment. So being richer doesn't necessarily mean being better. They did a study uh, on, we always like to talk about the, the youth today. And there was a time when we were the youth today um, but every generation likes to talk about the youth today. But they actually did a study that over the last 30 years, college students, their empathy towards others has dropped off 40%. And that is quite a large drop. And they give us some reasons for this. Why, why has this happened? Why have why are kids no longer interested in being helpful and uh, caring about one another. <clears throat> uh, the first one is, it says, is the internet. You know, the internet, while we have a lot of friends, uh, we don't see them face to face. We, they may put their problems on the internet, but it's really easy just to scroll on by. If, you're, if you don't have the time or the, what, the empathy to help them, you just scroll on by. It's real easy. And it says that um, most people, young people especially, prefer cell phones, media, to actually face-to-face -face interaction with people. Uh, and it, it's a whole lot easier to ignore people's problems this way. It also said in another study that the number of people, our young people especially, uh, the number of friends they had in whom they could confide and talk, that was almost zero. Um, so they have a lot of friends on Facebook, but they don't have a lot of real person friends. Um, the second one it said was that this generation has seen such a, an increase in violence. We see violence on TV, on the news, on games, on the internet, on YouTube. It's everywhere. And that after a while causes us to be insensitive or numb to killing, to death, to sickness, to all of these things. And the third one it says is our tendency today to just be busy and not necessarily that kind of busy, but just flittering around busy. Uh, we're multitasking, we're on the phone, we're on the laptop, we're you know doing five things at one time. And, you know, our, now instead of calling someone, helping you get them on the phone or writing a letter and helping you get a letter back in the mail, everything is instant and quick. And you can send five emails before you could ever get to the post office to buy a stamp. So everything is speeded up. And so there's no opportunity for us to slow down and notice people and really see them and really see what they need and what their struggles are. And so we just become oblivious to 
to each other. <clears throat> um, it said that particularly affluent uh, adolescents compared to lower income children, they had higher significant levels of depression, anxiety, substance abuse. So when we as adults, parents think that you know, we've worked more hours and we can bring in a bigger income, we can provide a better life for our children, may not be necessarily true. There may be other factors more important than how much income the family brings in. It said this began to affect the, the, the young people, even by seventh grade, that all of these uh, just feelings of anxiety and depression are uh, coming upon them even by seventh grade. And what are, they said that some of the findings they discovered in looking at this was number one, the achievement pressure. And I know that this starts in little league baseball to, to be the best, you know, you have the parents sitting on the sidelines screaming, hit the ball, make the home run, whatever. Um, and in fact, there's just a lot of pressure on our kids to get in the best schools, or get you know the best grades to get the best jobs. No longer is average good. Average now is failing basically. Um, so no one's allowed to be average. So these kids are under a lot of pressure to be to achieve and do more. And so it's probably not surprising that they would exhibit a lot of stress-related symptoms. The second one factor that may be influencing this is parental time. Again, we talked about how parents work more so that they can bring more money into the family. And so the adolescents are left with less parental interaction um, with parents or adults of any kind. Uh, the parents are just involved in these high pressure careers. Um, and so the, the child is missing out on uh, some just direct time, just time with their parents. The next one <clears throat> is uh, Luther that did this study found that a disproportionate number of the affluent adolescents were never involved in helping others. They were not involved in any kind of activity. They weren't taught by the family to help the neighbors or to do those kinds of things. And so their life began to take on this meaningless feeling to it. When you're helping others, excuse me, that gives your life meaning. But when you're just living for self, you begin to have really a meaningless life. And that's what these young people are beginning to feel because they haven't been taught or even modeled how to help one another, how to live in a community where you help one another. So for just a few minutes before we end tonight, we're going to look at the starting of what are the benefits of charity? Other than doing a mitzvot, other than you know doing this because we're commanded to, there are other benefits to it. And actually, and it, it's hard for us to maybe think this, but the receiver give the giver receives more uh, than the recipient does. So the one who's giving is actually getting more out of this interaction than the one who who uh, who, who is getting this? And they give us the example of Ruth. And it says that, uh, let me read this exactly so I get it correct. And her mother in law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? May the one who took such generous notice of you be blessed. And she told her mother in law by whom she had worked and said the man's name uh, was Boaz. Now it says, This is interesting Hebrew phrasing. It says, by whom I worked. And it says that in a manner, this implies that Ruth was actually doing something to benefit the owner of the field rather than the other way around. Um, it implies that it was she who did the favor for Boaz. The Midrash also teaches us, uh, in, in the name of Rabbi Yehoshua, more than the master of the house does for the pauper, the pauper does for the master. Um, uh, that is from Ruth Rabah 5 9. It says that it's it's um it's a lesson to us as we begin to do charity that 
uh, first of all, as the giver of charity, we are obligated not to make the recipient feel demeaned in any way. Um, and so first of all, the, the farmer is required to leave uh, gleanings in his field. He can't pick up the gleanings and take them to someone. He's got to leave them so that the poor person can come and be a participant in that. He can actually pick up the gleanings from the field. Um, it says the commandment to leave the forgotten wheat for the poor is meant to instill in us an attitude that giving to the poor is not an unearned entitlement for the needy that we give grudgingly. Rather, it's the right of the poor to take their share of Hashem's bounty. This is how Hashem is giving them their fair share. So it's not that we are begrudgingly, oh, here, I'll give you a little bit but rather this is their share. And the owner is not even permitted to lift the produce to hand it to the recipient, but rather the poor man must pick it up for himself, demonstrating that he is taking his rightful share. This is his portion of Hashem's goodness. And it says in this way, the poor person is a partner with the farmer and not just a lowly you know, supplicant. He's not just an employee an employee of the own of the person or uh, charity but that he's actually a partner with the farmer giving the farmer an opportunity to learn chesed and to be partners with Hashem and distributing Hashem's wealth that's where we're going to pause tonight next week we're going to look at some more benefits of, of charity as well as um how maybe we can implement it more uh you know, practically in our lives. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Leia and let her cover our windows to the soul. Wow, Miss Baya, there's so much. <laughs> that was awesome. I love it. I love your cup too. I'm going to have to find <laughs> one like that. Um, there's a lot that you talked about um, in this dollar, lesson. Dollar and store. It, sorry? Dollar store. Oh, cool. <laughs> there was a lot that you, you talked about in this study and last week's study that Windows to the Soul talks about today. So <laughs> it's very, um, I just have to smile. God is so in control. Okay, so in Windows to the Soul, which is this book, um, we are on uh, Parasha Amor. Let me see here okay parasha amor the first section is called holiness is not elitism i don't know about you guys but sometimes it kind of can feel that way <laughs> but this uh in this section our author does a really good job of laying this whole thing out um he starts off with um he starts off saying the Kohanim are not just beneficiaries of special privileges. They have are also have special restrictions. And the passage that he gives for that is verse 21, verse 1, sorry, chapter 21, verse 1. And God said to Moshe, speak to the Kohanim, the sons of Aaron, and tell them, each of you shall not contaminate himself to a dead person among his people. Well, believe it or not, our sages and rabbis look at this verse, probably not in the way that you're thinking. <laughs> the question that they talk about here doesn't have anything to do with how fair, unfair it is that the priest can't go to a funeral, it has everything to do with the fact that God says, speak to the Kohanim, the sons of Aaron. Well, in order to be a Cohen, you have to be a son of Aaron. So this is like double talk. Why, why is the Torah repeating itself here? Because remember, we've already learned there's no surproof. Sur I can never say this word. Surproof. <laughs> I can think it. I can't say it. Extra words. No extra words in the Torah. Every word in the Torah is there for a reason and a purpose. So why? Why is Hashem saying Kohenim and sons of Aaron. So he 
he goes on to explain that um, that the first six parashot in in uh, I believe we're in Leviticus uh, <laughs> addresses the divine service. So it's talking to the priests. And we have all this stuff about what they need to do and how they need to do it and how they need to dress while they're doing it and all this stuff that we've already studied, right? Um, you know, down to like what to do on Yom Kippur, all this stuff, right? The seventh parasha, last week's Torah portion, Kedushim, discusses general rules that apply to laymen and the Kohen equally, giving the impression that the subject of the Kohanim has been exhausted. But then the Torah returns to the Kohanim right here in Parashah Amor. So why is the Torah discussing, or why does the Torah digress from the subject of Kohanim only to return to it once, one parasha later? So the Kavner Rav takes notes of the aforementioned phrase, speak to the Kohanim, the sons of Aaron. What is the purpose, he wonders, of the seemingly redundant words? Um, and then he basically explains that they carry an important message for the Cohens, for the for the, the priests. He explains, having been instructed so intensively on the exclusivity of their role in the Jewish life, they might consider themselves an elite group superior to other Jews, especially in view of the Kohanim's stringent requirements. Kind of makes me think of some people who are very proud of how stringent they are in their observances. Um, for ritual purity outlined here, the Torah therefore reminds them that they are descended from Aaron, a man of humility, and boundless love for every individual Jew, a man who looked down on no one. Right there. <laughs> so just as the Torah um, did not want the Cohens to consider themselves elite, they don't want the everyday Jew to consider the, the Cohens elite either. And for that reason, um, it's, it's kind of like they're, the Torah is using parasha more to show this to the everyday Jew. Yes, they do a special role, but they're not the elite force. They are a Jew just like you are. And the other thing was that they didn't want, uh, Torah doesn't want the people to elevate the priesthood where it shouldn't be elevated to. Um, because then they would do things like protest the, protect the priesthood and not themselves, protect the, you know, it, it would put things out of the order that God wanted things to be in. It says, um, had the Torah immediately presented the restrictions imposed on the priestly caste, people might have attributed to them an innate, innate superiority, such that the Kohanim required additional protection from contamination. Instead, the Torah presents Parasha Kedushim, which be, uh, begins with an exhortation to every Jew to be holy and to live a holy life, for I am God, your Lord. The Torah repeats uh, time and again, teaching us to sanctify every aspect of our life by emulating God's ways. Once the Jewish people absorbed and understood the concept of holiness, and withdrawal from the mundane, they would see clearly that the Kohanim required special restrictions, not because of some innate superiority, but because of the nature of the priestly duties. So it's the priestly duties that require this, not because for some reason Aaron's sons were born different than everybody else. Does that make sense? Um, and he goes on a little bit further to say, in a metaphysical sense, the Kohen op occupy the middle space between heaven and earth. On one hand, they are God's emissaries to instruct, implement, and supervise the ritual life of the people. This aspect of their service is reflected in the title Kohenim. 
They also represent the people as their teachers, as well as through their sacrificial service, they perform on their behalf. This special role, <clears throat> this special role and outgrowth of Aaron's overflowing love for his fellow man is reflected in the title Sons of Aaron. The long and straight to Kia blast. Okay, so this is where he's connecting the, the blasts of the shofar to this whole thing about sons of Aaron and, and the Kohenim. So the long and straight to Kia blast heralds man's attention toward God. And it is appropriate for those bearing the title Kohenim should sound it. The staccato Terua sound mimics crying and it is a call to the introspection and repentance and is appropriate for those bearing the title of son of Aaron as representatives of their Jewish brethren to sound it. So when the Torah instructs the Kohenim to guard their holiness and refrain from coming into contact with anything that defiles them, they are addressed both as Kohenim and sons of Aaron. The implication is that the integrity of both of their roles require a higher standard of holiness. So I don't know about you, but I thought, wow, it's like, it's intense when you think that they're, they're being reminded to be like Aaron. And then if you think about it, when we get to um, the judges and, and you start like reading about <clears throat> how the high priest uh, Eli and his sons and Hannah and her prayers and on that whole story about how uh, the prophet Samuel came into being and how Eli's sons were so um, evil and wicked in the eyes of God. And you think about how God wanted the priesthood to remember that they are sons of Aaron and you kind of like go, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> Which ironically leads us right into the next section. He's titled this one, Small Steps to Corruption. And he says, during the second temple era, the office of Kohen Gadol unfortunately became corrupt. More often than not, the position went to the highest bidder, usually irre irreligious people who denied the authority of the oral Torah. God had uh, delegated them to teach and uphold. In the Talmud, Yoma 18a records that over 300 men served as Kohen Gadol in the 420 years of the second temple's existence. This is in sharp contrast to the 18 during 410 year existence in the first temple. Think about that guys. 18 men served as Kohen Gadol in the first temple period. 300 300 did the job of 18 in the second temple period's time frame. That just blows your mind. So he goes on to say, um, how is it possible that the holiest of institutions became so corrupt? And how did the nation permit it? And he goes on to explain that um, He says, according to the Talmud, uh, okay, so it goes on to explain that the first person to be able to purchase his role as the Kohen Gadol was um, named Yehoshua ben Gamla. And it was, um, it was his wife who purchased his position as the Kohen Gadol. And initially you would think, well, the people would be outraged, but that's not what happened because he was a, he was a righteous man. He just didn't quite fit the qualifications because he didn't surpass the righteousness of the other men, which is what the Kohen Gadol was supposed to do. And so the people were like, well, he, he was a, he, he's an appropriate candidate. And they kind of just let that one go. The problem was, is that was just like one little concession and that one little concession made it to where um, eventually, you know, it was like nobody thought twice about it. Nobody thought twice about somebody purchasing that position. And what ended up happening is that position then became purchased by those who sought power instead of those who sought to be the Cohen Gadol. And the, the, 
the last little sentence he has in that section says, the road downhill started with a small step. And I think that's a good cautionary um, lesson for all of us. You know, if you think about it, one small step in the wrong direction can lead to 420 years of not getting it right in some ways. The next section is called Two Faces of the Convert. So I, I thought it was interesting that um, in life, it, uh, life in the Balance, we talked about Ruth and uh, the, the, how the sheaves are supposed to be laid down. Well, we address that here too. Um, he says, as we celebrate the bounty of the land on the Festival of Shavuot, the Torah reminds us to not forget the poor. In chapter 23, verse 22, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not cut to the corner of your field as you reap, nor shall you take the dropped sheaves of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the convert. I am God, your Lord. And he goes on to explain that there are two forms of entitlements that are being described here, the corner of the field and the sheaves that you dropped. And he says that uh, the Torah demands that we leave the sheaves for the landless convert and the pauper so that they too may have a share in God's benevolence. So you remember how um, Fai was just now saying that um, this was God's giving us an example of his kindness, right? Well, in this book, our author is bringing out how this is God's providence, how he's looking after us which is kindness. <laughs> and sometimes I think we don't realize that the, the providence that God gives us is kindness because sometimes the lessons that we have to learn that actually go a long way to saving us or you know, from some mishap or, or helping us to learn and grow in some big way, those lessons can be painful <laughs> and frustrating and like, why now <laughs> kind of thing. And yet it's God's providence. This is his kindness to us. But the cool thing about this is in this one, he, the author's pointing out how this is God saying, even though society forgets you, I don't forget you. So let's go on and see how he does that. Okay, so there's a third entitlement called Shika the forgotten sheaves. In Deuteronomy 25, 19, it says, when you reap your harvest in the field and you forget a bundle in the field, you shall not return to take it. It shall remain for the convert, orphan, and widow so that uh, God, your Lord, will bless you and all your handiwork. He says the two prominent features distinguish these two verses. One, the Torah commands us to leave the, the paya and the leket to the convert and to the poor. Well, the shikha is to remain for the, the converts, widows, and orphans. Second is the entitlement of paya and leket is expressed in the active voice, leave it to them, while the shikha is left to them passively, it shall remain for them. So there's three questions that arise. One, why is the shikha omitted in this parasha? Two, why are widows and orphans only included as beneficiaries in the shikha as opposed to the convert who gets both? And three, why does the Torah express the entitlement of shikha in the passive voice it shall remain for them? So he goes on to explain the whole thing about how the landowner naturally tends to round out his corners uh, of the field of the harvest. And, and if he is law abiding, he will invariably leave one corner uncut, which is the payoff. He must also leave those stray stalks that in there in, inevitably fall to the ground, um, which is the laquette. The Torah does not want him to take the extra effort to reap these inevitable harvest remains. Rather, he is to leave them for the indigent. In effect, then, by sharing in the harvest, the landless convert and the poor are usually also landless, become partners of sorts 
in his fields. Thus, the Torah's con conceptual message here is these inevitable field remains belong to them. But since bundled sheaves are not necessarily forgotten in every harvest, the shikah entitlement is not mentioned until Deuteronomy. The fact that the Talmud derives that the entitlement of Peah and Laket belong to the widows and orphans as well as converts. Nonetheless, the Torah makes a special mention of the convert because he is completely without support. He is landless and has no extended family on whom to fall back in times of need. The widow and the orphan are somewhat similar to the convert in that they, more than any other of the poor people, are the elements of society most easily forgotten. Thus, when Deuteronomy presents the entitlement of Shika, the sheaves forgotten in the field, it is appropriate that the Torah singles out the people who tend to be forgotten. God also shows his special concern for those forsaking groups by expressing the entitlement in the passive voice. It shall remain for them, suggesting it belongs to them, a gift from God. The active voice, leave it to them, used for the corner um, of the field and the drop stocks, gives the impression that it is a gift of the landowner and comes from God only indirectly through his command. Here, though, what is forgotten belongs to the ones God has not forgotten. So I don't know about you, but I was I was moved on that one. To me, I I can. I can understand that feeling of being forgotten sometimes. <laughs> and I just think, wow, this is so cool how God's like, I see you. You haven't gotten anywhere. I can't find you. <laughs> the next section is crying like a baby. And in this section, he goes on to explain how when the shofar is sounded the, the, with the different tones, that it's just like when a baby cries. You know, and, and he, he explains this whole thing about where, you know, like if you if you have a baby and he's laying down and gets bumped, the shock of that will make him take in a deep breath, which sounds like one of the blasts. I think it's the the long one. I could be wrong. Oh, goodness. And then and then also after the shock wears off, he just starts crying out for help. And he says that in the same way, we need to do the same thing. Um. And this, you know, is especially key around Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur when we're when we're calling out to God. So he says here at the at the very end, he says on Rosh Hashanah, the voice of the shofar is a metaphor of our own shocked and then sad sounds as we face the judgment of the heavenly court. The first long tekiya blast heralds the majestic presence of God at this ceremonial acknowledgement of His divine reign, reflexively. As the awareness of God's nearness penetrates our consciousness, we are shocked and astonished by what we find. We have acted brazenly in a world that is not ours. We came face to face with our errors and the squandered opportunities, the debasement, the shame, and we are shocked to our very core. The gasping shivering sounds reflected our shocked state. The initial shame has paralyzed our breathing and we try to recover our breath. Only then do we give the expression of our sorrow and regret by a burst of anguished wailing symbolized by the tremulous Terua. The second her heraldic tekiya blast brings us back to the central theme of Rosh Hashanah. It is, after all, not a time to focus on personal needs and failings, for even this is a form of self-absorption. Rather, our task on Rosh Hashanah is to acknowledge and reaffirm our loyalty to God as king of the universe. The brief flash of introspection leading to the recognition of our own unworthiness facilitates our recognition of God's awesome majesty. Now the second tekiya sounds. Uh, summon us to return to the essential task of the day, the celebration of his divine reign. 
then the uh, next section, <laughs> I guess there's a lot of sections. So uh, it's called Second Chances. And he talks about the whole thing about hindsight being 2020, which it usually is. He talks about how um, during the Messianic era that God will give the Gentile nations a second chance, but that they um, will solely focus on um, the, the, you see, here where he expresses it. Okay, so our acceptance of the Torah at Mount Sinai played a dual role in our relationship with God. First, it gave us the blueprint for the ideal life and a transcendent life connecting us with God. The recognition of the great good of such a life will form the basis of, of the Gentile nation's complaint in the Messianic era. They will complain about not having had Torah as a schematic for living it. There is, however, a second aspect to our covenant that, uh, to keep God's laws. And it is expressed in our absolute acceptance of divine providence. Here we come back again to this divine providence. But this is looking at it from a little bit of a different angle. In this part, in this way of looking at it, we're saying the unqualified submission to God and acceptance of his will. Furthermore, we will willingly look upon ourselves or took upon ourselves the role of God's agents throughout history. Uh, when we suffered the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, bitter exile, murderous crusades, the programs, and even the Holocaust, we always maintain our faith that God was guiding us towards the ultimate good. Okay, so how is that different from the Gentiles? He says that um, accepting the divine providence is in the heart of the commandment of Sukkot which celebrates God's providence manifest in the Exodus and our miraculous survival in the desert for 40 years. The problem comes is that when the Gentiles observe Sukkot, uh, for whatever reason, they will get frustrated at the heat or the extreme temperatures, whether too cold or too hot or too wet, and they'll kick the sukkah and leave. And our author points out that, you know, it's not against Torah commands to um, leave the sukkah when it's too hot or too cold or, you know, inclement weather. But what isn't good is that they kicked it. So it's not the leaving, it's the kicking. <laughs> and he talks about how that's a reflection of their not accepting God's divine providence. They're not being willing to, no matter what happens, we're going to do this. And I thought about that. I was like, wow, that's intense because it just, I guess it goes to showing the in, inside of a person, you know, it shows, it shows when, when somebody is truly wanting to stick to something that they're going to fight tooth and nail for it. But when somebody's not willing to stick with something they're not going to do what it takes to learn it, to uh, pull it to their lives, to adapt it, so on and so forth. All right. So now we're at everything is everything. And it's interesting that uh, we were talking about Hesed again, because in this section, we're talking about Abraham. And our author brings out how um, everything in the world uh, means something different to everyone. But um, the Torah tells us in Genesis 24, 1, that God blessed Abraham with everything, that coal. Uh, there are various interpretations of what that means, but our author brings down that um, <clears throat> the sukkah is what was made for Abraham. God, God gave Abraham, the sukkah, it was everything. The sukkah connects us to the absolute goodness because it is the symbol of God's providence. It reminds us of the booths in which the Jewish people dwelled in the desert after the Exodus. And according to the Midrash, it also reminds us of the divine clouds of glory that escorted them throughout those years. 
The sukkah is therefore the symbol of God's benevolent providence because of Abraham's uh, piety and loyalty. God blessed him with the sukkah. In other words, with the specific divine providence that guided every step of his life and ensured that everything that happened to him was for the good, regardless of how it appeared on the surface. Unlike the lottery winner who does not know uh, if his new turn of fortune will play itself out, Abraham knew that everything that he encountered or experienced would be for his benefit. Everything was directed to him, uh, directing him to his destiny as the patriarch of the nation and would redeem all mankind. So literally everything, meaning everything. And I thought about that, you know, if you, if you really want to emulate Abraham in, in that way and bring out that same kind of chesed within yourself, you got to think about every last little thing that happens to you, whether it's your child being disrespectful to you or your boss giving you a hard time or traffic on the highway or a bug that won't leave you alone, seems to follow you around. You know, whatever crazy little thing is going on in your life, God let it happen. What is he telling you? What is he teaching you? What is the purpose of it? There is nothing purposeless that happens to you. And if you look at life that way, you will be emulating Abraham in that faith. Okay, so the there's two sections left. The this one was an interesting one. Um, the Sadducee agenda. I did not know this much about Sadducees before reading this. Um, during the Second Temple era, the uh, an ideological battle raged between the rabbis who upheld the oral Torah and the Sadducees who rejected it. The world outlook of the Sadducees was assimil assimilation assimilationist. They wanted to assimilate, okay? Uh, their religious observance was lack, lax. The Rambam in Avos 1.3 writes that the Sadducees really wanted to reject Torah altogether but they felt that they had a better chance of success if they did it incrementally. The rejection of the authority of the oral Torah became their flag, uh, their fig leaf of justification, the cover up of their underlying motive. I read that and I thought about all of the people that I know and love who still cannot accept oral Torah. And I'm just like, wow. You just don't know how much you're in the wrong camp. So going forward, we said it says in um, that, that there is a lot of debates that the sages had in the Talmud, but they picked out a couple of really key ones that the Sadducees would engage in. And I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, in Shavuot 2316, it says, and you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Shabbat. Uh, from the day you bring the Omer barley offering seven full weeks. So right away, the very first argument the Sadducees gave is when do we start counting the Omer? I don't know about you guys. How many people have you heard bring that up? This is not a hard concept, but because they don't want to accept the oral Torah, this is what they used as their big first battle. So why? Why would they use this? You ready? I'll tell you why. Because they wanted to put distance between being brought out of Egypt and receiving the Torah. They wanted to make it nebulous. You know, if it's the first Sabbath, Sabbath, not holiday Sabbath, after the Torah or after Passover, then it will change throughout the years when Shabbat would fall, right? And that's putting some nebulousness and some distance between people and God. Because what, did, what happened on Shabbat? We received the Torah. And they don't want to believe that there is God. That's what this comes down to. Okay, so. Um, okay, so he says. <clears throat> 
by in okay by insisting that the Cohen okay so this is the next big argument another dispute that seems uh philosoph philosophically innocuous means you know it's a small little deal centered around the incense ritual of the Kohen Gadol performed on Yom Kippur. According to the rabbis, he entered the Holy of Holies with a pan of incense in one hand and a pan of burning coals in the other, pouring the incense into the coals after he's inside. The Sadducees contended that he placed the incense on the coals before he enters the Holy of Holies. By insisting that the Kohen Gadol be enveloped in a dense cloud of smoke before he entered the Holy of Holies, they symbolically denied the teaching of the sages that God is intimately involved in the particular affairs of the people. The issue of separation establishing God is more distant from man held a special appeal to the Sadducees because it gave them more freedom and less accountability in their behavior. This may have been at the root of another dispute. According to rabbis, during the festival of Sukkot, the Kohen poured a water libation on the altar from where it flowed into the drainage ducts and mixed with the regular wine libations. The Talmud in Sukkah 48b records that the Sad Sadducees rejected this teaching, which is based on oral law. Rav Zadok HaKohen, among other rabbinic commentators, finds a deeper significance in the mixing of the water and the wine libations. Water is life-giving substance associated both with Torah itself and God's kindness, chesed. Wine blood red, excuse me, in color, suggests strict judgment, din. The mixing of wine and water is uh, symbolically brings to close the process of judgment and repentance and uh, begins, that begins with Rosh Hashanah and continues throughout Yom Kippur by blending the libations, we petition God to temper his just effected judgment with his overflowing kindness such intense divine involvement in human affairs however was um not something the sadducees <laughs> were really interested in they wanted to assimilate and it would go against their agenda if god was really so close to us so um <sighs> Okay, so then the Talmud in um, Barakos 58a describes an encounter between a Sadducee and a blind Rav Shises. Shis so you note that the, the rabbi is named, but the Sadducee is not. I think that's a mercy. Um, so basically, you've got the Sadducee and this rabbi Shises. My tongue just doesn't want to work sometimes. Uh, as they await the, the passage of the king on the roadside. So it's like a parade. Everybody's out waiting for the king to come, right? But this rabbi is blind. Um, and his attempts to, uh, he's attempting to greet the king, but um, he's being ridiculed by the Sadducee. It's like, how are you going to even know when he comes, you know, kind of thing, teasing him for being blind. Okay. So on three successive occasions, the Sadducee observed calamitous troops approaching and incorrectly assumes the king is with them. Rav Shishes, sensing a sudden hush, correctly detects the arrival of the king's entourage and pronounces the appropriate blessings in his presence. The Sadducee, still contemptuous, asks, how do you bless what you cannot see? The Talmud then wonders about the fate of the, um, of the Sadducee and gives two answers. One view is that his friends put his eyes out, and the other is that Rav Shishis reduced him to a pile of bones. What does the Talmud wonder 
why does the Talmud wonder about what happened to the Sadducee? Why should it assume that anything happened to him? Apparently, the Talmud sees in this episode allegorical references to the philosophical dispute with the Sadducees. In this story, the Sadducee who uh, reveres temporal power. So remember, we've talked about guys purchasing the, the high priest seat, um, not wanting to be close to God. They want to assimilate. They want to be in power, in earthly power, right? So temporal power is referring to this very thing the Sadducees were very much wanting. Um, okay, feels that the rabbis turn a blind eye to its value and importance, just as Rav Shishes is literally blind. He scoffs at Rav Shishes and ridicules his disabilities. Rav Shishes responds effectively. Imbued with Torah's wisdom and perspective, he exhibits the superior understanding of temporal kings, seeing in them the reflection of the glory of the divine king who appears in a still thin sound. Since the story is allegory, so as Emmett would say, we don't take it seriously, or excuse me, we don't take it literally. We do take it seriously, just not literally. <laughs> uh, since it's uh, allegorical overtones, the Talmud inquires about the fate of the Sadducees and the extension of all that, you know, so by, by that, the extension of all Sadducees who misled so many of their Jewish brethren. The answer is that God's justice will be done. Either his friends, meaning those led astray by the Sadducees, will eventually come and put out their, uh, come to put their senses and, and turn against them, putting out his eyes. Or the rabbis themselves will fully demonstrate the hollowness of his views, reducing him to a pile of bones. I have read that and I was just floored. I don't know about you guys, but I was like, whoa, you know, that whole thing about there's nothing new under the sun, what goes around comes around. This whole argument is still very much here and in front of us today. I mean, in so many different ways. The very last one, is two expressions of joy. And I couldn't help but thinking about Miss Baya's lessons over the last two weeks when we got to hear this one. So joy is the common requirement of all festivals, not just Shavuot or Sukkot, all of them. Although it's only mentioned specifically in context, context to Sukkot. In uh, verse or chapter 23, verse 40, and you shall rejoice before God your Lord for seven days. The Talmud enumerates eating meat and drinking wine as expressions of this joy, but of course, the feeling in the heart is paramount. Elsewhere, we find that joy is central to all Torah observance, which is Deuteronomy 28, 45 through 47. And all these misfortunes shall befall dot, 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 because you did not serve God, your Lord with joy and satisfaction in all your plentitude. So <clears throat> he goes on to talk about how language reflects the priorities of culture. And he says that Eskimos like have a whole gob of ways for talking about snow. Jews are not as concerned with snow, but they, just like the Eskimos, have a whole gob of ways of talking about joy. So he says that uh, the most prominent among these numerous terms for happiness um, is simcha, which we talked about with Ms. Batya, which appears several times in the Torah, and then sason, which appears once in Deuteronomy 28.62. These are the two most frequent expressions of joy that filter through our liturgy. The Vilna Gaon draws a distinction between these two words. The term simcha, he explains, refers to happiness that derives from attaining, whereas sason refers to happiness that derives from having. Um, a closer look at the words themselves confirms this distinction. In Hebrew, similar sounding words formed 
by changing only one letter are related. Consequently, the root word for simcha, samek, is etymologically related to, um, okay, T Z A M E apostrophe A C H. So instead of saying samek, it's zamek. I hope I said that right, um, which means to grow or flourish. Okay. The transformation is accomplished by the exchange of the first letter from a sin to a zadi, both of which produce similar lingual sounds. Simcha, therefore, portrays the happiness derived from activities of growth or attainment. The root of sasam is sas, which is uh, shin shin. Twice the letter shin whose numerical value is 300. And the number three is associated with completeness. Space consists of three planes, time spans, uh, past, present, and future, and so on. As such, the letter shin, shin sin expresses completeness in its numerical value, which is a multiple of three. And the number, uh, in the number of digits three, and even in its three pronged shape, the shin has the, it looks like a W. Along these lines, the Talmud frequently uses the number 300 as an exaggerated expression of size. So like where we say, oh, it's millions and millions, right? Well, they, they say 300. <laughs> the word sass compounded of double shin expresses an intensification of the idea of completeness, a happiness derived from having everything. These two joys st stemming from becoming and being encompass the fundamental joyous experiences of man. Those experienced as a result of the activity and those that come passively as reflecting on the state of being. So you have the happiness that comes from, you know, growing and being given to and all of that. And then you have the happiness that comes from a contentment. And I think that gives us a lot to think about. That is where our core portion ends this week. And that was a lot. <laughs> Does anybody have anything they would like to say or comments they would like to make? Again, amazing how they intertwined. Yeah. I do, have a, I do have a question for you or uh, Shomer Matt or anyone. And I have my own thoughts. But you started out by talking about how the, the coin is not to touch the dead body. Mm -hmm. And we also talked about Hesed. And mm -hmm. the story that comes to my mind, of course, is the Good Samaritan. But we always focus on the Good Samaritan. <clears throat> But prior to the Good Samaritan coming by, there was a priest that went by. Was he not required to stop and bury what he thought could have been a dead body? How do you think he would be required to go get someone to do it? If he's not supposed to touch a dead body, then he should take care of it in another way. Oh, Ahmed's got his he hand didn't his Take care of it at all. Ahmed, go ahead. What, what, was your, what was your idea? Uh, I was going to let y'all finish. I was oh. going to be next to my. But if you're asking, I know what, it. Do you have a response to what her question was? Yes, I do. The, uh, the, the answer is that the Cohen, as well as the Levites, have the obligation yes. to defile themselves for the sake of a met mitzvah is what it's called which is an unattended corpse could you hear that i should but i do that both both the, uh, the priest and the levite have uh, an obligation to uh, take care of what could have been a dead body. Yeah. Yes. And of course, I, I knew that from being in the Hever Kadisha at one time. 
but we sometimes don't think about that when we're reading through that story of the Good Samaritan because we're just focused on this one thing, this one guy, good guy did. But what about those other two? <laughs> but you know <laughs> what? Really yes, I, you, you just um, nailed, you just you just nailed that point like home even more <laughs> because the priest is not an elite class. I'm not. He, he's just as responsible as any other Jew for his fellow Jew. All right, Emma, go ahead and, and um, make your comment. Okay, so uh, the, the one thing I wanted to... Uh, share real quick on that was the sources from Mishnah Nazir 7 on the uh, the priest or the Levite having to defile themselves if they come across a corpse that's unattended. Mishnah, what was it? Nazir 7. Okay. Okay. And you. then in the Talmud you would also be able to yeah. see that as well. Um, yeah. Yes, okay, so the main thing I wanted to share, though, was on the support and the, the poor. Uh, I was, I, again, I was in James a lot this week and uh, looking at the, the passage that talks about true religion is one who looks after the orphan and the widow in their distress. And I thought about the fact of Hashem's household consists of the orphan, the widow, the poor, and the convert. Wow. And we learned this later in Devarim. And Hashem says, if you gladden the members of my household on the festivals, then I will gladden the members of your household on the festivals. Wow. And that's sourced out in the Kehot Humash for the uh, commentary in uh, the track or, or one of the Torah portions in Deuteronomy. So understanding the fact that those who we're supporting are actually partners with Hashem, it's like because Number one, they're part of Hashem's household. And number two, the fact that the person is being supported, the teaching of the letter Samic is that support not only works with the person who gives, but it works with the person who receives because the person who wants to give doesn't have the opportunity to do so if there's no one for them to give to. Wow. So, but I, uh, I loved everything that you um, both brought down uh, for tonight and there's definitely a lot to go back and listen to and to ponder on so we really appreciate you giving us all of that <laughs> and the um the simka and the zemak is the word that you were talking Thank with you. the Saudi. <laughs> i'm not very that, good at wrapping my tongue around some of this <laughs> that's a tricky word like hebrew is so so tricky like i i struggle with it so much and that's why i'm very uh like i'm always kind of like self-conscious to to speak the hebrew sometimes because <laughs> i'm like oh i'm gonna get critique you know but anyway the the cool thing about the zemak and simka is that they both are like this very uh blossoming type feeling you know mm -hmm. and zemak is one of the names of mashiach oh, and cool. simka mm -hmm. does rearrange to mashiach oh, okay wow. that's, it. that's great Hold on. wow thanks Emmett. Anybody else? Hey, hey, there needs is someone else. Uh, Milani, we, uh, are you trying to say something? We can barely hear you if you are. Oh, you know, my microphone, I'm mute all by itself. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Anybody else? <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, y'all have a great week. Don't forget to count your Omer tonight and for the next ha last half of this uh, 50 days. As we, uh, Leah was talking about Shavuot, a few. It's coming. Are you there? Very soon. Um, and or online and
Oh, are you back? I'm back. I just it blinked for a minute. <laughs> it froze. I didn't hear the whole last part. Did you already turn off the recording? Or are we still recording? We're still recording. Hang okay. on. <laughs> we'll screen back up here. Here we go. Okay.